Well, uh, I'm uh, uh, given the honor of introducing our keynote speaker this morning, and uh, I'll keep it sh short because you have his biography in, in the program notes. Uh, but Philippe, Philippe Bourguignon came to Washington from Paris about five years ago, just like Lafayette, to start a revolution. And since then, he has been all across America uh, focusing on the American spa experience and looking at it with new eyes because of his many years in the European hotel industry and having chaired the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, uh, where he hosted many leaders of business, industry, and politics, where he met Steve Case and was uh, enticed to come to Washington. And now, uh, I think Philippe has learned the, wa the ways of Washington. Uh, he, he bikes uh, from his apartment in town to his office near DuPont Circle. And uh, he enjoys uh, the scene in Washington, as well as at Miraval, where he now has a house. And he's working on some very exciting new projects, which I can't reveal today. But we do have Philippe, and it's saving you a trip to Istanbul, because he, he is bringing us his update on the keynote speech he gave at the Global Spa Symposium, uh, Summit, Global Spa Summit last year in Istanbul. Philippe was the keynoter, and I'm happy to present him to you today. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you very much, Bernie, for not only inviting me to participate to uh, uh, the sessions today, uh, but giving me the privilege to address this audience now. Uh, it reminds me of um, a time when I was the CEO of Euro Disney, where one day I had to address, we invited 300 teachers, French teachers, uh, to explain to them that uh, Disney was a very good cultural product. And uh, if you remember, in France at the time, Euro Disney was uh, not seen as a very French cultural product. So I prepared a very uh, good speech, and I was a little shy. I addressed them. Uh, fortunately, they enjoyed Disney that whole day. It was at the end of the day. And uh, what I did not expect is that they applauded me at the end. So I said, well, after the formal speech now, let me tell you exactly what I really think personally. And I started again. So today, it's about the same. Uh, I have only one speech. I will not do two. Uh, but I'm very impressed by uh, this audience and uh, the fact that here you have uh, all of the people who actually created this industry in the US uh, way, way back. And uh, myself, I'm very modest because I'm a newcomer to this industry. Um, also, you may wonder why you, you, from my name and my accent, you can probably uh, see that I'm French. <laughs> and uh, uh, by the way, I didn't start Revolution, Steve Case did. I'm helping him to, to uh, grow it and, uh, and, and, make it a, and make it a good, uh, a good organization. So anyway, uh, being from a foreign country uh, creates perspective because you, uh, you, you are looking at this country, uh, even though I've been, uh, all together I've been living uh, in the US on three occasions, seven years in New York, years ago, where my two children who are grown up now uh, were born. I lived then in uh, Los Angeles for uh, four years and I've been in uh, Washington for five years. But even though I, I think I now know and understand this country relatively well, you always have a different perspective uh, being, from, uh, being from abroad. And this is what we're going to try to do. I'm, I'm trying to give some perspective to what the spa industry and the growing trend of wellness uh, are. Uh, so we're going to start, I would say, very high in altitude on uh, very, very global uh, trends. And then we'll, uh, we'll land and be uh, more, more pragmatic and more uh, detailed and specific 
on why the spa industry is playing a key role in the development of wellness and preventive medicine today. So, um, the other thing I, I wanted to mention is that uh, when I do my first job, my father told me, you don't care what the job is, you take the highest paid job. Because this pay will follow you for the rest of your life. Because they increase you 10% from there, 15. So the, the, the start is very important. Well, I did not follow his advice. <laughs> and, and I took a very poorly paid job, which allowed me to travel. Because my dream was to travel and travel the entire world. And this is what I've been doing for 40 years now, a little more than 40 years. I see a lot of young people in this room, so they say, this guy is a dinosaur. But uh, <laughs> even though, you know, I think 40 years is not, is not, uh, is not uh, very long ago. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what happened in the last 40 years because it helps understanding what's going to happen and how fast the next 40 years are going to move. So 40 years ago, uh, the world was very different. When I started working, uh, there was no fax machine, there was no unleaded fuel, there was no soft drink cans, there was no barcodes, uh, there was no email, no digital pictures, no DHL, no GSM, uh, no Microsoft, no eBay, no Google, and certainly no Facebook and no Twitter. <laughs> and this is not long ago. Um, and uh, there was not lead certified buildings, right? and life expectancy was about seven years shorter than it is today in just 40 years. So imagine what the next 40 years could be if it moves that fast and is going to continue to move fast. So what are now a few important facts? What I'm going to, it's not, this is not uh, imagination, whatever, it's pure facts. Uh, there are a few important facts uh, about the future. First, we are entering the age of women. Now each time I say that, women are, <laughs> there are a lot of women here. I don't do it be nice to you, but the fact is that we are witnessing the feminization of society and of human activity. This is what in Europe we call Eve Olution. <laughs> the age of singles. If you look around you, you will be surprised to see how many single households you have. And uh, it's roughly, in the Western world, in its cities, it's roughly 50% of the population which one way or another live by themselves. So half of the population, uh, I'm, I'm taking out teenagers obviously, right? for one reason or another, live by themselves. That's an important fact. The age of cities. We were, centuries ago, it was the age of cities. Remember Venice and the influence of Venice uh, in the world trade, or Genoa. Today, Shanghai, Mumbai, and one city which uh, was in the news recently, and that's a very interesting example, Cairo. The first time I went to Cairo was in 1973, a few weeks after the war ended with Israel. The, the, the cars still had the, 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 the blue paint on their, on their, on their lights. 1973, Cairo had 5.7 million inhabitants. Today, 19 million. 19 million, this is the population of New York State, which is the third most populated state in the US, after California and Texas. These are significant facts. Last year, half of the world population was living in cities for the first time in humanity. 20 years from now, 60% of the world population will live in cities. So that's billions of people. It's huge. Moving in cities. <coughs> the age of knowledge. Knowledge is very key. And this is one of the things which the United States understand very well. This is why Americans are so innovative. Uh, why America uh, is also uh, so different in a number of ways, but this is one of them. America attracts the best talents from the planet, <coughs> Russians, Chinese, Indians, even French. 
Spanish, from anywhere in the world. Talent flocks in the US. Very interesting to see, you know, eBay board, twice a year, we had what we called a technology update. And we had an update for about 20 people who actually were doing like mobile, new mobile applications, new technology applications and so on. You enter the room and they were not two of the same nationality. They were from everywhere on the planet. And this will trend to one thing called cultural hybridization, which we'll come back a little later. The age of cheap. I don't mean that negatively. Uh, I, I wrote a book uh, some time back, and I explained, and that's the best possible explanation, that uh, 20 years ago, the price of a car was about twice as much by pound than the price of tomatoes. Today, it's exactly the opposite. And cars are much better today than they were 20 years ago. They are safer and they are better. Okay? So, uh, cheap. We produce things cheaply, and we are entering an age where people are more interested in no frills, low cost, real value, versus you know, things which are expensive, and doesn't mean lack of quality. Age of noise. Noise is everywhere. I mean, you know that. iPod, which by the way I like, huh, so I'm not criticizing. Uh, iPod, mobile phone, car, voice, music. The relentless cacophony of urban living takes its toll. Think <coughs> silence. That's one of the things, by the way, I've learned at Mirabel. Silence, silence, and the value of silence. The art of escapology is going to become the art of survival. And last, the age of, or before last, the age of prevention. Healthcare system, uh, you all know that, are on the verge of collapse. That's not in the US, it's basically everywhere in the Western world. We need lifestyle strategies uh, which are very, very different from the future, future. and today, uh, obviously, there will be a lot of discussion around this subject. The future is nothing less than the creation of a new culture of health. And last, the age of age. Obviously, population is aging, but in better shape. And uh, very interesting what uh, Deborah uh, said, uh, said about you. Uh, but in, in general terms, uh, beyond your personal case and, and, and how well you handle it, life expectancy is today, in the US, 77.9 years. 81.1 in France. <laughs> a little better, <laughs> um, because we work less. <laughs> but anyway, um, and, and again, it uh, grew seven years in the last uh, 40 years, and it's going to probably grow another seven years in the next uh, 40 years. So that's what I call the age of age. So these were the facts, undisputable. Uh, now, what are the consequences? Th these are more opinions. We are not at the beginning of a new millennium, but we are uh, on the threshold of a new civilization. Uh, today we are entering the age of uh, interactive television. Uh, we don't know yet exactly how far it's going to take us, but it's going to take us very far. Uh, obviously, robots. Uh, you have robots uh, everywhere. I uh, was uh, reading a document, a friend of mine, who uh, is the CEO of a robot company in south of France, uh, there is this uh, convention, uh, which I didn't know about, about robotics and robots. And uh, they have robots for everything. Uh, so the last presentation was a robot like washing uh, windows. You, know, you, you put a robot in. So they have a robot. And the CCTs, uh, why not? Uh, uh, solar powered uh, electrical cars. Uh, that's for tomorrow. Uh, not, not tomorrow morning, but very soon. So this is obviously uh, going to change a number of things. At the same time, again, if I make my 40 years parallel, 40 years ago, 40 years from now, in 2050, the world population would have grown by 2 billion people. 2 billion. Most of those 2 billion are going to come from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. 
And this is the most formidable challenge that uh, the humanity is going to face uh, for another reason. Uh, food availability first. Water. Uh, obviously climate. And last, very important, immigration, uh, obviously, which you see uh, again everywhere. A new intellect. Uh, with the change of millennium, uh, we moved from the Gutenberg millennium to the digital uh, time. And in doing so, uh, it's a different side of the brain which is working. Uh, Gutenberg millennium was the left-hand side of the brain which is all about logic and reason. The other side of the brain uh, is more about paradox, freedom, and intuition. Next evolution is the consumer society, which has been my generation, uh, is moving toward an information society. Uh, our mass society is moving toward a society of individuals. We'll come back to that later. And our standardized society is moving toward the hybrid society, uh, which uh, I alluded to a little bit earlier. Last uh, piece of evolution, too many crises, uh, too much stress, uh, too much passion, too many doubts, too much food, too much sugar, too much greed, too much everything, will ultimately give us back to ourselves. And from an age of excess of passion, we're going to enter, I think, into a period of more reason. Uh, excess starts to be seen as an issue. Not yet completely, but it starts. And uh, we are anticipating the end of a long period of what was called irrational exuberance. So with those facts and those evolutions, uh, obviously, uh, they will all conduct to a number of behavioral changes. And I'm, I'm not, my speech would be way too long to do it, so I've selected a few which, at revolution, we think are important for our businesses. So it's just a selection. It's obviously not an exhaustive list of all behavioral changes you're going to see in the next few years. First one, jobs are the new assets. This is a fundamental change in the US. By the way, I would like to, uh, I don't want to, I, I could do a parallel between Europe and the US, that's subject by itself, but one fundamental difference between Europe and the US, which not so many people understand, is that the US has been traumatized by the 1929 crisis, crisis and the loss of jobs. So the US always does whatever it can to create jobs. Europe had been traumatized by inflation, which led to the Republic of Weimar in Germany and to Nazis. So Europe is fighting inflation even against job creation. And this will always be the fundamental difference between the two countries. But we're saying that, for different reasons, jobs are becoming more important in the US than they have ever been. And clearly, today, it is more important to have a job than to own a home or to own stock. And that's going to change the relationship Americans have vis-a-vis -vis ownership. And we think that when you use things only part-time, it's a huge window open to what we call sharing. Sharing houses for vacation. Sharing cars. I'm not going to advertise for zip car, but there it is. So, Sharing is going to be an evolution, and relationship to ownerships is going to change. Consumers are dropping out altogether from buying non-necessities. And this is the result of the last crisis, but it was underlying a little before. Value versus frugality. So, uh, two or three examples. Why pay an expensive one-ounce facial cream because it is in a beautiful crystal little flacon, which makes tons of margin for the maker of the cream. And instead of having one ounce, won't you prefer to have three ounces in a slightly less elegant little flacon? Why have huge flower arrangements in hotel lobbies, which are very expensive? 
And at the same time, be charged 20 bucks for your Wi-Fi in your room. Why rent a car in a conventional rental car organization where you have only three places in a city where you can pick the car up and where you can rent the car for only 24 hours when you can rent it by the hour at the corner of the street? So these are changes. People are becoming more frugal and more conven convenience oriented. They want to pay for what they have or you want to pay for what you have decided has value for you, not what a marketer has decided has value for you. <coughs> and that's another big change. A new luxury. Luxury is becoming more personal and uh, authentic and less formulaic. I keep saying the example in France, uh, the fact that uh, today um, people used to trust the Michelin Guide. And a Michelin guide, to have a star for a restaurant, you need to follow certain criteria. And today, frankly, client or guest don't give a damn uh, on the fact that you have white gloves for service and the metro D, whatever it's obliged. And what's very interesting, over the last five years, every year, you have two or three French chefs who drop their star for the Michelin guide just to become more natural and authentic. That's the evolution of luxury. Um, I could go on and on on this one, so I'll, I'll stop because maybe too long. Now, <laughs> so, um, today, also, uh, when you go on vacation or when you go to a restaurant, more uh, and more people want the luxury of a great tasting meal prepared with uh, organic food uh, according to an authentic uh, local or regional recipe. And uh, also learn a few tips on how to do it when you go back home. And this is what we're going to have at lunch with Chef Shad, who is uh, there, who uh, is our chef at Miraval. And, and, uh, and this is, again, uh, this is the new definition of luxury. Ease of access. Today, everything is accessible the way you want, when you want. And only a few people don't understand it. I had a big fight in France with the French movie industry because once I said that today, it's up to the consumer to decide if he wants to watch a movie on his, on his iPad, on his television, or in, or in the theater. The time where you impose quotas and the movie has to go in theaters for before, uh, one year before it can be released on DVD and six months before it can be elsewhere and so on, that's gone. And they are trying to hang on to through legislation and conservative legislation to things which are object of the past. Today, people want things, when they want them, how they want them. That's ease of access. Authenticity. People today prefer no frill things which are authentic. The, the bling bling luxury is going out. Um, my, my friend Bernard Arnaud, who owns Vuitton, doesn't like when I say that, but I'm convinced that, well, by the way, if they didn't have China as their prime market, there would be a, there would be a suffering. So people today look at more at authentic experiences, which are meaningful, unique, and uh, very intimate. Today, some I say that uh, people are having fun, but I'm saying that very seriously. Uh, people are tired of too much perfection and too much excellence, and they claim the right to imperfection. <laughs> the right to, uh, or less perfection. No to the constant desire for still more or still better. Uh, this, uh, after years of, uh, which are dominated by order, we are going to see years dominated by control disorder. It's so much better to have something which is natural, authentic, nice, warm, even if it's not totally perfect. At Mirabal, we say we prefer deep comfort to artificial luxury. Obviously, nature and sustainability uh, goes with this definition of authenticity. The consumer wants to connect with nature, with local culture, and with the environment. Less what about me, more socially, socially conscious. That's another evolution which leads to a new one. Uh, 
Cultural hybridization, we talked about it briefly. Uh, we are at the age where civilizations are colliding, uh, colliding in a positive sense, and where uh, bit and pieces of different cultures are reassembled to new cultures, whether it is in Europe, in the US, uh, North America, but also Latin America. Uh, in terms of tourism, new destination will be ideas and concepts as much as they are physical destinations. And those new destinations obviously include destination spas, which share of market regarding tourist destination is going to grow tremendously in the next few years. Uh, togetherness. Uh, people like being together uh, all times, but in a, in a very different way. Uh, today, um, people, and tomorrow, people will want uh, more emotion, more doing things together, not only having fun together, doing things together. Uh, giving and receiving and taking part in things. Uh, this is what I call togetherness. So people, we'll come back to that later, and it's not a contradiction, are more individualist than they have ever been, more about themselves. And at the same time, they want to be together more than they have ever been. Personal growth. Obviously now, consumers expect to achieve a level of fulfillment when uh, they go on vacation, that carries forward into everyday life. And that's what a number of us here in this room are uh, trying to do. Uh, wellness, well-being, discovery, uh, learning, uh, uh, mindfulness. Also, mental recuperation. Years ago, when we were going on vacation, we were tired. Our body was tired because we were too long, whatever. Today, the issue is not fatigue of your body, but it's stress. And stress is, obviously, we all know that, very different than fatigue. Uh, stress takes everything of you, including your, your uh, intelligence and your creativity. So uh, we are moving, again, into uh, spending uh, more uh, energy toward uh, stress reduction than we uh, used in the past. Uh, as a summary, uh, away from look at me type wealth, more toward life better lived, away from correcting and more toward preventing, less about owning possessions, more about great experiences. And then the last thing is me. So what in Europe we call ego logic, it's like evolution, what about me? Uh, taking care of myself, healthy living. This obviously is something which becomes more and more important. The search for meaning, the quest for spirituality are increasingly important. The search for happiness. And uh, very interesting uh, that it's very recent, uh, three weeks ago, David Cameron, uh, the new Prime Minister of the UK, uh, decided that uh, he wants to create a new measure of happiness versus GDP growth. That's very interesting. So I'm going to quote him because uh, he changed the word happiness into well-being, which also, by the way, is uh, interesting. I'm quoting him. It's time we admitted that there is more to life than money and that it's time we focus not just on GDP, but on GW, global well-being. Interesting that he has substituted happy with well-being, I say. So much that David Cameron is trying to get the concept up and running at the time where the UK is going through the most drastic budget cuts they had since Margaret Thatcher. Interesting that they do it at a time where the living costs are soaring in, uh, in the UK. Recently, he added another thing. Well-being cannot be measured by money or traded in markets. It's about the beauty of our surroundings, the quality of our culture, and above all, the strength of our relationship. Improving our society's sense of well-being is, I believe, the central political challenge of our times. Very interesting. So, happiness. The search for time, obviously we all 
are looking for time and uh, quality time. Quest for concrete dreams no longer enjoy but be. Uh, people want to rediscover themselves, but at the same time rediscover others. And the quest for health, uh, obviously, uh, living more healthy. So it leads us to wellness, which is going to be, now that we have a global perspective, so let's go into uh, wellness. Combining personal growth, which we just talked about, and healthy living is wellness. But Susie Ellis has a better definition of wellness, so I'm going to quote her. Those things that enhance quality of life, improve health, and bring a person to a high level of well-being. Pampering, she adds, speaks to the goal of most spagoras of stress reduction and relaxation, and that in itself is preventive. <coughs> so let's talk about prevention for a short moment. Prevention has moved front and center in the health uh, field, obviously. And the spa industry, I would like to re-emphasize what Deborah said, and the spa uh, industry's role in prevention-focused health should be greatly emphasized. For years, spas have been doing prevention, focusing on exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, and a number of other things, including uh, Eastern stay well uh, medical paradigm, like traditional uh, Chinese medicine or uh, Ayurveda, among, among others. Uh, and this happened uh, years before those cutting edge hospitals unleashed integrative health centers, uh, interweaving traditional medicine with many of these established uh, spa approaches. As SRI International says, SPA is part of the wellness paradigm where integrated proactive wellness uh, approaches are taken to improving the quality of life as opposed to the conventional medically oriented reactive approach that is taken to solve problems and is more of a treatment paradigm. This is what led us at Miraval to the creation of the Andy Weil Wellness Center, which we are very proud of. We believe that health is just not the absence of disease, but rather a sense of wholeness and balance that creates an inner resilience uh, and balance, I'm sorry, uh, resilience to meet demands of living without being overwhelmed. And this is, uh, I come back to that, what I personally have learned at Miraba. And I would like to just a little uh, personal comment. Uh, in my career, uh, by pure accident, I had to turn around uh, companies uh, on two occasions, major turnaround. And it's the first time I have a job where I don't have to turn anything around because Miraval is doing very well, but Miraval turned me around, really changed me. So, uh, I, you know, I, I would like to, to emphasize that. I wish, I say, uh, I wish I'd known Miraval when I was 30 years old. That helped me a great deal, but never too late, right? So, um, the wellness center, uh, the wellness program allows guests to interact with uh, the world around them in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way when they go back home. Uh, as a result of living this way, uh, optimum health also brings uh, with it a sense of strength, joy, and confidence. <laughs> wellness as it relates to health is a series of strategies uh, which should be uh, personalized, uh, very specific to each individual, that allow optimum health to be achieved. An important initial step is, uh, for those strategies is we think that the individual should decide what is his own definition of health. It comes back to the same as the marketing issue is, today we are in charge of our, of our own thing. So what is my personal definition of health. And this is what Mirabal helps you answer. Uh, and we provide an environment uh, outside of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, realities, away from the pace and the pressure of life, which helps you answering this question, as well as a few very important questions, which, by the way, I never asked myself before. Who am I? What is important in my life? What are my core needs? Who are 
the people that are most important to me, and so on. And, uh, you know, we tend not to ask ourselves those questions and uh, very often not even try to attempt to answer them. Uh, once you answer, it's already a major, major step toward uh, oneness. So once the vision of health is known, uh, not that easy, as I say, the next step involves developing a plan on how to get, uh, how to get there. Oftentimes, it helps to use a coach, uh, which is what we provide, to facilitate the process and guide you uh, through. And the coach may also be a motivator as well as a source of inspiration. And he, may, he, may, he or she may lead you to doing things you are either not comfortable doing or things which you are not even aware of. That's the advantage of using those uh, coaches. We strongly believe that the wellness is going to be the driver of the growth of the spa industry in the future. SRI International estimates that there are already 200, they say I round it to 290 million, they say 289, so plus or minus one, million uh, customers of uh, spa and wellness in the 30 most developed countries in the world. That's a, that's a, that's a significant uh, figure. And uh, growing fast, so it's huge. Why this growth? We at Miraval see three reasons for this growth. First, the aging uh, baby boomer, my generation, this group of population, is reaching the point where healthcare is their number one concern. Motivated to stay healthy and maintain, as far as long as you can, a vibrant lifestyle, these boomers will look to other sources of wellness outside the traditional Western model, medicine model. They are open, we, our generation, are, as well as the very young generation, but I've come back to that. The problem is the generation in the middle. <laughs> so we are very open uh, to experiencing all of the options in the alternative and uh, complementary approaches. And as the spa industry continues to expand into this field, so will those people who will follow uh, and visit those spas. Second, the other extreme, Generation Y, the youth people, 25% of the US population. Values earth and sustainability, uh, first of all. Uh, but also, remember what we said earlier, this generation is less about <coughs> reason and logic, more about intuition, freedom, and paradox. In addition, and obviously as a consequence, they are very um, electronically savvy and they like personal attention. Egology is very clear for this youth generation, me, myself. It's not selfish, by the way. It's, it's just taking care of myself, but I'm part of the group. They are the result or the driver for the change from this consumer society into the information society. And this would be an entirely new subject, but what we are witnessing today in Tunisia, in Egypt, and in Libya is linked to this. This youth, by the way, look at who is in the street in Dole. They are this generation, not, not the middle aged population. So, uh, and those, uh, these youth are used to uh, healthcare, uh, obviously, uh, they are used to wellness, and uh, because it's paradox and freedom, they are much more open and, 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 uh, and, and less stubborn about uh, trying different things. Last, uh, they have been, they, they were born with stress. I, I hate to say that, but they know what stress is. We learn stress over time, my generation. They have been stressed from the time they started working or they were at school. So for them, a massage anti-stress is part of their daily routine, if you want, which was not our case. I remember uh, the first time we talked uh, in, in a previous company I was the CEO of, we talked about uh, putting a number of spas there, and the reaction of the people, well, well uh, why massage? I'm not sick. Yeah. So uh, the youth generation uh, doesn't have this, uh, this uh, feeling, very interesting. And, uh, a manicure or a pedicure for them is as regular part of their care routine as uh, brushing your teeth for, for all of us. So, uh, huge potential in this, with this generation. And the third reason wellness is going to drive the spa market are women. 
first feminization of society, we say, remember, uh, evolution, but also women have always been better than men, men in prevention, in taking care of themselves, clearly. Men are more about uh, managing a crisis when they, uh, when they get sick. So uh, more and more uh, women uh, partners or wives uh, are going to push their, their uh, other half into uh, more prevention. And uh, because women are the first driver of uh, destination spa occupancy, obviously it's going to help driving the market. So back to Miraval, and then I'll conclude. I'm sorry I've been a little long, too long. No, it's okay. Thank you. So uh, we think at Miraval, obviously, that we are the uh, ideal place, place for uh, wellness to occur. Everything about uh, our place speaks uh, to the notion of becoming more mindful and more self-aware from the uh, mountains. Uh, Bernie mentioned I bought a house. Uh, that, that's the best acquisition I ever did. I, I have this house, uh, uh, you know, at the foothills of the Catalina Mountains, and, and uh, only this is appeasing. I mean, just watching the mountains and the painted skies uh, of Arizona is uh, it, it extremely uh, in, inspiring. So that's, uh, that's the place. From the artwork on the walls and throughout the ground we have at Miraval to the music of native, dr native drums and, um, and flute uh, to the mingling of bird songs. By the way, again, I cannot resist telling personal stories, but I spent in those mountains three days with uh, a guy we have with an American Indian, uh, Tony Headhouse, and uh, he, explained me, he explained me the importance of the ground uh, for his ancestors and why those grounds were peculiar. Well, were not like any ground. And if the Indians came here, there were specific reasons which were practical but also very spiritual. So, uh, uh, by the way, those, those the three days were absolutely uh, fascinating. Not totally comfortable, but fascinating. So that's what uh, we have at Miraval, uh, all the way to this uh, fantastic bed uh, we have. Uh, I was uh, talking with one of our guests the other day. He said, well, it's like bubble gum. <laughs> it's, truly a, it's truly a good bed. And last, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, the, place, the place itself, the, the ground, uh, has an energy that invites deep reflection and transformation. Uh, all of the experiences we uh, create at Miraval, and I would like to salute here a person who couldn't come today, uh, and I'm very sad for that, it's Michael Tompkins, who is the president of Miraval, Arizona. Uh, we were very closely as a team. Uh, he's been, uh, frankly, the inspiration and the renewal uh, the renewal of Miraval, finding uh, all those new ideas and evolving Miraval into this uh, wellness. And, and I would like to uh, salute uh, the, the work and creativity of uh, Michael here. Um, we will continue to expand uh, quality, complementary approaches to health that are cutting edge. Again, uh, this is where uh, Michael is of, uh, uh, you know, uh, has a great, great uh, spirit. Uh, now, the last thing I would like to mention is that uh, beyond the, uh, the programs, uh, acupuncture, massage, behavioral uh, health, nutritional counseling, nursing services, uh, sexuality uh, counseling, sleep enhancement, and many others, the important is that you can combine whatever treatment or activity you want and it's going to apply to your whole person. Uh, and because Miraval is about choice, you select what you do uh, yourself uh, without influence. You, you move through the Miraval experience as you wish uh, for whatever specific needs you have at the time of your stay. Uh, again, we, that's why we like this notion of freedom which we think is going to become more and more important. We, we think that the time where people are told what to do are gone or on the way uh, to go. And last of my conclusion, I read an interview of the uh, Surgeon General of the United States uh, recently, uh, Dr. Benjamin, and uh, I wanted to uh, quote her. Uh, two answers she gave to, uh, which I, I really uh, liked. Uh, she gave to the uh, uh, New, York, uh, uh, New York Times interview. Question, when you were nominated for Surgeon General, your critics tried to disqualify you on the basis of your weight, 
saying you were perpetuating rather than battling it? By the way, that's a tough question. Answer. My thought is that people should be healthy and be fit at whatever size they are. Uh, really, uh, I, that I, I admire the answer. It's so true. Second question. What sort of exercise do you recommend for people who don't love it? I want exercise to be fun. Don't want it to be work. I don't want it to be so routine that you are bored with it. We used to jump rope a lot and double dutch and went to a disco to have fun and enjoy ourselves. We did not go to the disco because somebody said, go dance for 30 minutes. <laughs> Maybe we need to dance as a nation. I would say that for France also. But yes, I love to dance. And whenever I am at events and places with music, I will dance. That exercise is medicine, and it is better than pills. It cannot be said in a better way, and I think reflects so much our philosophy at Miraval. Cannot agree more, and I also love dancing. So I'll try to dance with her next time we have together in an event. Thank you for your attention.